All right, everybody, let's get started today. How is everybody today? Good? Good. Should we do a big good morning? Ready? One, two, three. Good morning. All right. Everybody's awake. This guy's excited. Uh, dude, you didn't do that, did you? Probably not. OK. Let's just ho let's hope not. <laughs> well, there seems to be other spots around here, so OK, good. All right. Um, OK, so today we're going to continue our uh, discussion of the virtual memory system. Uh, on Monday, we got through paging. We got into paging, right? So, so we essentially motivated uh, the idea of paging by looking at the, the problems with both base and bounds, which is really terrible, and segmentation, which is better, and which we borrowed a lot of ideas from, but still has, so has some issues, right? And so today, we're going to continue on talking a little bit about now that we have these pages, Right? Which, which we like. There's things about pages that we like. It's nice fixed size. No external fragmentation. We're small enough to limit internal fragmentation. We can use the hardware to help us make it fast. But what happens in the operating system itself? Right? So once entries are in the TLB, that's great. We're all set. Right? But how do entries get to the TLB? And how do we make sure that we can locate information about pages on the system quickly when it's needed? Right? And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit today about what happens when we run out of memory. Right? So you guys, I, I, think, I think you guys know what happens, uh, but we'll talk specifically about, about sort of how we can use a backing store, right? a slower, larger device, in order to allow processes to allocate more memory than is actually present on the system. Right? And we'll talk about what happens, how we get that to work, and then what happens in cases where we need to either move pages out of memory or bring them back in. Right? And then finally, if we have time, we'll finish up with just a little note about hardware and software managed TLBs. All right? So there seems to be something wrong with the partner selection form. A couple of you guys emailed us uh, at this, some point this morning. I'll look at it and fix it. It's probably just something broken on the website. And so how many people looked at assignment two? Right? So everything is out there. Uh, how many people looked at assignment two yesterday? OK. <laughs> some people. Didn't, some people didn't raise their hands when I asked them if they looked at the assignment, but they raised their hands if I asked them if they looked at the assignment yesterday. Right? So hopefully, hopefully the second group is a subset of the first group, but whatever. Um, so so I, I, I thought a lot about exactly how to, you know, how to work in the design aspect in this class. So when, when, I, when this class was taught and I was a part of it, typically we would really stress the design aspect. Right? We would have each group work to produce a design for about a week, and then we would have that group meet with the core staff to discuss the design in detail. Right? Um, we just don't have enough TAs to do that. Right? And so I was trying to think, you know, I didn't want you guys, I want you guys to get some early feedback from us because that's a really important part of doing well on assignment two and assignment three. Right? Again, these assignments are really underspecified. So a lot of what you guys have to do for this assignment is, first of all, figure out what you need to do. Right? And then second of all, come up with a plan for how to do it, right? a plan that involves your partner, a plan that involves meeting the objectives and testing and, and sort of some reasonable uh, plan. And there's things that you're going to have to design yourself. right? So we're not going to give you the data structures necessary to store page state. We're not going to give you the data structures necessary to store information about file handles, for example. So those are parts of the system that you'll just have to come up with and design yourself. right? So what I came up with was this, this compromise, and hopefully it's not a terrible compromise. But what we're asking you guys to do is to put together a two-page, I'm calling this the executive summary of your design document. Right? So your design document, in, in theory, to be good, would actually be longer than two pages. right? And it would be more specific. But the executive summary is covered in the assignment. And what I want the executive summary to do is I want it to do two things. First of all, I want you to use it to demonstrate to us that you understand the assignment, right? that you understand what you have to do. Right? So if we read your assignment to executive summary and, and we say, well, geez, like this person, there, there's no process support here at all. Like we may point out that there are certain system calls that you will be unable to implement properly without adding some things. Right? So you, we really want to see that you guys have thought through and figured out all the different things that have to be done. Right? And the second part, of course, is that we want to have some idea that you guys have come up with reasonable ways of doing this. Right? So we want some you know, high level description in readable plain English about how you plan on handling some of these things. How are you going to allocate process IDs? Right? How are you going to store information about page tables? Right? How are you going to get wait and exit to work properly? Right? So things like this. 
So look at the assignment. This is the, this is the goal, right? And, and the reason it's two pages is, is partly to kind of force you guys to be concise and precise about what you're doing, but also clearly because you know, we have a limited number of TAs and, and all you know, four of us are going to have to read you know, 10 or 15 of these each or something like that, right? So we're trying to keep our, our workload manageable, right? But the goal is you get these in before spring break, and, we'll, and the course staff will have time to look at them so we can give you some feedback. And hopefully by the time you guys really get into the implementation, you'll have some feedback from the staff about, no, 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 that's not a good idea. You know? or, or, yeah, that's a great way to do this. right? And so, and so that hopefully that'll build some confidence in helping you guys tackle the assignment. All right? Any questions about the design portion of this? Right? This is an experiment. We'll see how it works, right? I hope the two pages is long enough to give you and guys enough time to, to summarize the key points in the design. I think it is, OK? And actually, maybe it could even be like one page, right? But, but the point is, on some level, the shorter the better. But please make sure that you, you accomplish those two objectives, right? You tell us, you demonstrate that you understand the assignment, and you propose some reasonable plan of action and some reasonable solutions to the problems that are inherent in getting system calls on OS161 to work, OK? Any questions about this? All right, great. So questions on the material on Monday. So Monday, we talked about segmentation. We went back through segmentation. And then we got into page translation, right? Just, just really just got through page translation. So any questions about, about this material before we do a little bit of review? Any questions? All right. So given that there are no questions, everybody understands this stuff perfectly, right? So how does segmentation work? I'll start in the back of the room, right back here. Segmentation, how does it work? Um, what, what, what do I need? Segments of, segments of uh, um, address space. So what do, so, OK, so I have segments. That's good. What defines a segment? What are the, there's three pieces of information that define a segment, right? Give me one of them. Want to help her out? Any contributions from back? Yeah, uh, base. Okay, there's a base. There's a base. A base what? Uh, a base uh, memory address. Memory. What kind of memory? Uh, Remember, we want to be specific, right? We have to, we have really two kinds of memory now. We have what kind of memory and what kind of memory? Virtual. Virtual addresses, right? Which act like memory, and then we have physical, physical memory that is memory. And you have a base. This is kind of a trick question. You have a base physical address and we have starting points here. a starting <laughs> virtual address, right? So I really have a base virtual address and a base physical address, right? That's what, def that's what defines how I do the translation, right? And someone also said I have a third piece of information? Bound. Bound, right? Size of the segment, right? So I need to know where is the segment in virtual address space? Where is the segment mapped to in physical memory? And how large is the segment, right? With those three pieces of information, I can perform a, both a check to make sure the address is valid and a translation. So how do I do the check, Garen? Um, you do make sure the base is in between, or make sure the start virtual is in between the base and bound. Well, OK, so, so I'm sorry. I have three pieces of information. I'm giving you a virtual address to translate. You're close, right? So the virtual address I give you has to be what? inside some segment, right? Yeah. So there has to exist a segment for this process. Remember, I'm always translating virtual address in the context of a process, right? There has to be a segment that contains this virtual address, meaning that the virtual address has to be in some segment, or meaning that it has to be between the start and the start plus the base of some segment, right? That's how I check an address, OK? How do I translate an address, Keith? Um, translate it from? Yeah, OK, virtual to I'm giving you a virtual address. And let's say it's OK, so I found a segment that it's in. What, how do I translate so you it? You subtract the base from right. the address, and then um, this is that basically it. And then well, well I, OK, so you got the first part, right? So I subtract the start virtual address, and then what do I do? Want to help them out? <coughs> That's what I thought you did. There's, there's one more part here. Add it to the base physical address, right? So I need to figure out the offset inside the segment. So I subtract the start virtual address, and I add the base physical address, right? 
That, that's how I do this, okay? So I take the virtual address, subtract out the segment start, add it to the segment base, okay? <laughs> Questions about segmentation and segment translation, right? All right, a couple of, of review questions from last time. What's a common operating system trick to make something slow look faster? Caching. Caching. And what is, what is caching specifically? Yeah, you, now you, 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 you gave the answer. Now you have to tell me what it means. <laughs> so I have a big, slow thing. And to make it fast, I put a smaller, fast thing in front of it. Why is the thing I put in front of it usually smaller? Because if it was big, I would just use it as the big thing, right? If I have a big, fast thing, don't bother with the you know, big, slow thing, right? Just use the big, fast thing, right? So right, yeah, at some level, is, is, if, you, if you think, think about it, right, the, the things on the system that are the fastest to access are the ones that you have the fewest of, in general, right? What's the fastest thing on the system to access? Anybody? Register. Registers. Registers, blazingly fast, right on the processor. Next fastest thing, maybe. Cache, what cache? L1 cache, right? Small per processor cache. What's the second fastest thing, maybe? L2 cache, what's next? Maybe there's an L3 cache. Let's say there isn't an L3 cache. What's next? Main memory, right? What's after main memory? Disk. And I, you know, maybe next time we'll put up a graph of this, because like, you can graph these on a logarithmic axis, right? And essentially, as all of these get bigger and bigger, like, I mean, your system might have 32 registers or something like that, right? And you have 320 gigabytes of disk, right? Yeah. So anybody know this? Solid state disks, price per byte compared with, compared with spinning disks. Very, still very expensive, right? So if you have a high-end machine, then you might have an SSD, but it's typically slower, right? Big SSDs are killa expensive. They're just really terrible, right? I'm, try I'm trying to remember. I mean, when I was building my machine, uh, my machine has an SSD in it, but it's like a 256 gigabyte SSD or something. When you get up to a gigabyte, or, or no, when you get it, well, you get up to like half gig and, and higher, they just get really, really terrible, right? But it's coming, right? And, and, and we'll talk more about this when we get to storage, OK? Cache, right? And at some level, one way of thinking about operating systems overall is, is just a series of caches, right? Registers are cached for L1. L1 is cached for L2. L2 is cached for memory. Memory is cached for the disk. Disk is cached maybe for the network, or maybe memory is cached for the network. It's all a bunch of things with different properties that, that we're trying to get to work together to seem like, like they're all as fast. All as fast as the registers, maybe. Like, I have as much space as the entire internet, but it's as fast as my registers, right? That would be like, that would be the dream machine, right? OK. Now, in this particular context, how do we apply this, this classic technique? We throw a cache in front of something. So first of all, back here, Carl, what's too slow? What are the thing that we're, what's the thing we're trying to make faster in this case? Access to memory. Well, ac OK, access to memory is part of it, but, but, but it's actually right up on the slide, right? What's the thing that we're trying to make faster? Translation. Address translation, right? I'm, I'm, I'm only letting processes use these virtual addresses now, so I've got to translate all of them. And if I do it in the kernel, it's way too slow, right? And then what specific piece of hardware do I use to make this faster? Anybody? TLB. TLB, right? I used a translation look aside buffer to cache the translations so that the kernel doesn't have to constantly look them up, right? If the kernel had to constantly look them up, way too slow, right? Cla classic technique. Slow thing is the kernel, fast thing, TLB, right? Where do entries in the TLB come from, though? Who, who puts them there? The operating system, right? And specifically the kernel, partly because we have to have privilege in order to do multiplexing, right? This is, this is how I divide and enforce memory divisions, right? Is by managing entries in the TLB, right? We'll talk later in class, again, toward the very end, about cases in which the hardware can actually put entries into the TLB, right? But the operating system is always in charge of what those entries are, right? The hardware might be able to find them, but the operating system is always in charge of establishing them. Right? That's how we multiplex memory. That's the privilege that the operating system has that allows it to divide up and enforce these divisions. Right? All right. Pages, right? So we came up with this great idea, pages. Pages are, are, are neat, right? And, and what, but what are pages like? Right? How can you think of pages? Pages are like what segments? 
fixed size segments, right? Every page is like a little segment. It has a start virtual address. If it's in memory, it has to start physical address, but the bound is always the same. So we typically just ignore the bound and we say, you know, the pages are 4K and then we don't have to think about the bound, right? All virtual objects on the same page map, on the same virtual page map to the same physical page, right? This is like having, a, again, having a fixed size segment. All the addresses in that segment map into the memory that's reserved for that segment, right? All right, the portion of the virtual address. So again, now, now that I have virtual addresses with fixed size pages, right? I can talk about a portion of the address that refers to the virtual page and the portion that refers to something else, right? So what do I call the part that refers to the page? Anybody remember? John. Don't remember? Go down the row. No idea? I just worry, virtual page number, right? It's named after the virtual page, right? There's only one thing to remember here. What do I call the rest of the virtual address? The offset. the offset, right? It's the offset into that virtual page, right? OK? Now let's talk about how do I do translation, right? Got page translation, I have a virtual address. So what's the first thing I need to do? How do I check that the address is valid? Anybody? Well, let's say, I'm, let's say I'm loading an entry into the TLB. The TLB said, hey, I don't know anything about this page. The kernel is, is trying to check to make sure the address is valid, right? What's that? Well, I need to split it first, right? Because splitting it allows me to identify what? Well, maybe the first 20 bits, depending on, but in general, I split it into what? The virtual page number and the offset, right? So I take the virtual page number, and now what, what do I have to, what, what does there have to be in order for the address to be valid? There has to be a translation defined for this virtual page number. Right? This virtual page number has to be a virtual page that the operating system has decided to let the process use. Okay? So in the case of 4K pages, exactly what I do. 32-bit address, split. 20, 12. 20 is the virtual page number, 12 is the offset. Right? And I check to see if there was a virtual page translation defined for this virtual page number. Right? Now how do I translate it? Let's say I find a virtual page, a physical page translation for this virtual page. How do I translate this virtual address? Hmm, I picked on you guys enough. Over here, right there. How do I translate this virtual address? He doesn't know. Let's go back to the corner. Anybody over in this corner want to? Well, remember, I'm not, I'm not, the, the TLB has asked me for help, right? So the TLB doesn't know anything about this, right? I'm the kernel. I'm trying to figure out how to translate this, right? Exactly, right? I take the physical page and I add the offset back on, right? And if I'm doing this with 4K pages or another page where there's a nice split, I can just yank the address apart, plop it right back together, right? All right. Let's talk about page size, right? So what, it, what happens if pages get too small, right? Remember, we, we chose this page size and it was kind of a compromise between a couple of things. So what happens if my pages get really, really small? So the TLB isn't going to be able to ver map very much memory, right? Because the TLB is fixed size, so that's one problem. What's the other problem? Too much kernel memory devoted to what? All the information I need for the translations, right? Twice as many pages means twice as many translations. We'll talk today about the state that the kernel is going to keep around, right? But the data structures today are designed to grow in a reasonable fashion. But they will grow as the number of virtual pages grows, right? So I can't map it off memory in the TLB, and I have too much kernel memory devoted to data structures. Right? What happens if the pages get too big? Huge pages. Sounds like a great idea. You know, I can map lots of memory. You know, the kernel data structures get really small. What's the problem? Internal fragmentation. I, you know, a process needs 32 bytes, and I give it a 2 gigabyte page. Right? You know, it might as well just give it its whole, you know, we might as well go back to base and bounds at that point, right? That, that would almost be better, okay? All right, any questions about this now that we've gone through this? Yeah, John. Yeah, is it possible for the, the kernel to remember that a process owns like a chunk of pages instead of remembering all the individual ones? Like yeah, sure. So, so one, of, one of the things that is frequently done, right, is that you can imagine that I can, I can define something in the kernel that almost looks like a segment, right? that has a start address and an end address that's a multiple of the page size, right? And then essentially, I can figure out, 
so, so there's two things I have to check, right? One is that the address is valid, right? The kernel is, that the process is allowed to use it. And so I can use that segment-like thing to check if the address is valid, right? Without having to look through all the page structures, right? Then, but the next thing is, then what I might be doing is I might have swapped out parts of that segment, right? So on some level, I do need some per page information somewhere, right? Because what I might have done is I might have taken half the pages in the heap and, and, and hid them somewhere where the process can't find them, right? And so when the process asks for that page again after, you know, a couple of hours, I need to be like, okay, where'd it go, right? So I, need, I do need to keep some page information, but you're right. There is a way to combine some ideas from segmentation in order to do the, the validation check, right? With the idea of paging, which allows me to move things around in a page granularity. Yeah, it's a good, great question. Any other questions? Questions about... Sorry. So, so there's usually one TLB per processor, right? That that is in charge of translating the instructions that are executed by that processor, right? And if you look on your kernel, what you'll see is that there's actually so so if I invalidate, what 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 problems does this cause, right? Let's say I have a process running, and for whatever reason, I'm going to invalidate an entry in the TLB, and we'll talk later about why I might do that, right? But what, on a multi-processor machine or a multi-core machine with multiple TLBs, what problem does this create? Right, because I have four TLBs. So the mapping might be loaded in every TLB. And if I really want the process to stop doing it, what do I need to do? I need to, well, essentially I need to find a way to yank it out of every TLB, right? And if you look in your, your OS 161 code, this is referred to as TLB shoot down, right? What it means is that I, I'm, one, co one core is trying to you know, potentially evict a page from memory and invalidate the TLB entry. Right? And on some level, it has to communicate with all the other processors to make sure that that translation is, is evicted from the TLB if necessary. Right? And, and what is actually used to do this, at least on our system, are interprocessor interrupts. Right? So there's a way for us to, to use the, the interrupt mechanism to send another processor an interrupt, which causes it to enter the exception handling code and the kernel gets control. Right? And we can use this to implement TLB shootdown. All right. Good question. Any other questions? Awesome. All right. So let's talk about how we store this information. Right. So we, we talked. We, we just previewed on Monday the two requirements for kernel. Uh, so for the kernel virtual memory system. Right. And this is essentially what you guys are going to have to do for assignment three. Right. This is almost a perfect description of what assignment three encapsulates. Right. Yeah. Robert. Can I ask a question about the shootdown? Yeah. Well, it's the same mechanism used to do a system call, but it doesn't translate to a system call. Okay, I mean, so you need access to do that. You can issue the command, but what actually happens? So, so what will happen, right, is that the processor that is, try that, that is kind of leading the shoot down will, will send an inner processor interrupt to the other. Let's say I have two cores, right? I'm trying to get rid of the page, right? So I'm trying to invalidate all the TLB entries, right? You're running along happily doing something else, right? What I do is I send you an inner processor interrupt. That's the same, it's, it's, it's more accurate to think about it like a hardware interrupt, right? The other processor will trap into the exception handling code and be like, what just happened? Like clearly there's something that just happened that needs my attention and they'll realize that it's me, right? And I'm over here telling you, if there's an entry in your TLB for this page, please flush it because I'm clearing that page out. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, right. And and it and it leverages this this inner processor interrupt mechanism, right, which is necessary to do this. It's expensive, right? This essentially means that well, you know I have to every core has to trap into the kernel and look for this, right? So this is kind of ugly, right? Um, but you know again, it's one of those things that just you just have to do to ensure consistency, all right? Okay, so two requirements for for page state. One is that I need to store the state compactly, if, if hopefully, right? Because again, the amount of memory the kernel has to use for these data structures grows as the number of virtual pages. So if I can slam it into small data structures, I'm doing well. The second requirement is when the TLB asks the kernel for a mapping, it says the process tried to use this virtual address, I have no idea what to do. The kernel has to locate that address rapidly, right? Because the faster I can do this, the faster I can get that instruction restarted and the process goes on its way, right? Okay, so, so what information, let's talk about some of the state that we need to store, right, about each virtual page. What's, what's, what's the most fundamental piece of state? Let's say the page is in memory, right? What's the most fundamental piece of state I need to keep around? Duh. 
It's a good ringtone. Yeah, what's that? OK, well, I wouldn't call that the most fundamental state. That's, that's, that's good. That's something we need. Did I hear it from up here? Yeah. That's another piece of state I need. But the most fundamental information, what am I trying to do? The physical address, right? I said it was in memory, right? But on some level, the location. Where is the data that was on this page, right? Now, it, 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 hope, it might be in memory. We'll talk today about where else it might go, right? But when a process tries to use a virtual address, the kernel has to figure out, what the heck did I do with this data? You know? Like, it wrote, some, it wrote some data onto this page a while ago, and now it's using the page again. What the heck did I do with that data? All right, so that's the first thing. Okay? Could be a memory. Could be on disk. It also might be a new page that the process has never used before. A page that's valid, that a page that's, that's allowed to use, but you know, if I allocate some heap, the first write into that heap will cause the kernel to have to locate some information. And, and what, what will I do in that case? What, what, what do I return it, right? It's asking to write into this page that it's allowed to write to, but that it's never used before. What, what should I return to it? What, what will that page be full of? Nothing. Zeros, right? So I need to return it a blank page. We'll talk about this on Monday, right? Monday we're going to go through a whole long overthought example about exactly how, how all this stuff fits together, because I think it's important to see, all right? So permissions, right? Another piece of page state that, that you guys hadn't thought of, right? Again, I like these virtual address abstractions. It allows me to assign permissions to virtual addresses. But if I'm going to do that, the kernel better remember what they are. Right? So if I allocated this page as read-only, I need to know that. Right? Because if the process tries to do a write, I need to stop it. Okay? And then uh, we talked a little bit. Somebody mentioned, Robert mentioned, has this page been used recently? So in order to do page replacement and to figure out, once I run out of memory and I have to start actually moving things around and maybe moving pages out of memory, it's very, very helpful to have some statistics on the usage of those pages. Right? And this is not always easy to capture, but usually page table entries will have some of the state. Right? And, and again, what's the requirement here? What, what are we after? We want to store this information how? It would be great if, this, if I could store this information in a very, very what? Anybody? What's that? Compact, right? I want this to be compact. Because the number of PTE, the number of, well, I shouldn't have said PTEs here, OK? The number, the amount of state that I have grows as what? What's that? Well, the number of page table entries, but how many page table entries will I have on a system? Roughly. I need one entry for, for each what? No. Page. Virtual page. Right? Every, every, and, and that's worse than the amount of memory, right? That could potentially be much, much larger than the amount of memory I have. Because processes might have allocated a lot to virtual address space that they're not using. But for every page in the virtual address space, I need this state, right? So the total number of virtual ad pages allocated by all the processes running on the system. OK, so we refer to this as a page table entry. A page table entry stores, and I've, I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself here. We'll, I'll explain the page table part in a minute. right? But a page table entry stores information about a single virtual page used by a single process on the system. Right? And sometimes we refer to these as PTEs. And normally, we can actually cleverly jam all this stuff into one 32-bit machine word, right? which is great. Right, because it means four bytes for page table entry. That's usually about the best we can do, right? So let's go back and let's say that we have 4K pages. How many bits do I need to represent the physical, uh, the, the location potentially, the virtual page number, the location on disk? How many bits do I need to do that? 20, right? And then you know I might need four bits for permissions because I've got three different permissions. I might need one bit to to determine whether or not the page is in memory or not. And then I might need you know, like one bit to figure out, has the page been read or written to recently? And you'll see that I still have some space left. This is only 26 bits. Right? So I have six bits left over that you can do anything you want to. Right? And, and I don't know, people find things to do with this stuff. Right? But anyway, this is one of those cases where I do some, try, try to do some clever tricks to, to sort of make this as compact as possible, mainly sort of using some bit masking and stuff. Yeah? So, so right, that's a great question. Per, you, you, can think, you can potentially think of permissions as being a per segment thing, right? So this goes back to John's comment. I can store some of this information potentially in a segment data structure, 
right, that I would also have to access, right? But on some level, every page has a permission, right? If I assign permissions per segment, I can store them in some sort of segment data structure, right? But I still need to know for a particular page what are the permissions, right? But you're right, I might be able to yank this out of here, right? Save four bits. Yeah, Robert. Is there remaining six bits for as, as a cache match? For caching? For caching. What would I cache in there? So, so the, the remaining six bits, I mean, the problem with the remaining six bits, right, is that they're sprinkled all over the place, right? They're interleaved between all the other bits, potentially. Um, my guess is that most systems find a way to put those to work, right? They might do something where instead of just storing a reference bit, they actually have some counter that they use that, that, that is incremented when the page is accessed. I don't know, right? We, we might be interested to look at Linux and see what Linux stores. You could, yeah, actually, you could do that, right? If you had a TLB that had, I don't know, what's two to the sixth, whatever, you know, that many slots, right? You might be able to figure out which slot it was in in the TLB. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, yeah, great idea. So if I if I need to figure out which cores have loaded this translation, that's a great idea. I could I could use some bits for that, right? So I could have one bit per core, and I could set that bit. If I have four cores, I can figure out okay, this translation is loaded in these two cores, and so when I'm doing shoot down, I need to I need to talk to those cores to make sure they yank it, right? That, okay, great idea. All right, so, so the other thing I need to do, I mean, this, you know, this you guys are gonna get, you guys are gonna get to do this for assignment three, right? So I'm not gonna go over this too much, but this is just, this is just, you know, bit, bit tricks, right? The, the more interesting part of this is how do I find, so now I've got this page table entry, four bytes per page, per virtual page on the system. How do I find this stuff, right? So essentially, the pro remember our old example: process, machine, store to address, OX 10,000, right? And the MMU says, I don't know anything about this address. It's not in the TOB. Uh, I don't even know if it's valid or not. Kernel, you got to help me out, right? And at this point, right, exception happens. The kernel starts running, and if we diddle around here, right, and, and we take all this time looking around, trying to fit, then 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 the look the the worst thing that the thing that we didn't want to happen already happened. The entry wasn't in the cache, right? So now that I have a cache miss, I need to make sure that that path is as fast as possible, right? So, so again, I, I think I've just given it away, but what are the requirements for how we locate page information? There's actually two complementary requirements here. One of them I've just hinted at. What is that one requirement? Speed. Be fast, right? I mean, this is, this is what people sometimes call, oh, ah, no, I gave them both away at once. Shit. Okay, this is what sometimes people refer to as a hot path, right? This, gets, this path gets executed a lot, and if you can trim off a couple cycles from it, you can improve the system, performance of the system quite significantly. Right? All right, and what's the other one? Maybe if anyone who saw the flashing on the screen. What's that? Compactness, right? Why? Right? Why, why do I care about compactness? Okay, you, you, you saw it, so now you have to explain it to me. Right? I've got, I've got this, I, I need to store all this page information. I want to be able to locate things quickly, but but what, what's the other problem here, right? I mean, all these data structures are going to do what? What do I have to, what do I, what does the kernel have to have in order to store these? They're going to take up space, right? So if I, if I have too much space to make this fast, then, it's, then essentially I'm, I'm reducing the amount of memory the processes actually can use, right? So there's some balance here between the speed of translation and the compactness of the data structures, right? So, so let's, let's explore this, right? So we, we call this structure a page table. Right? A page table is some data structure that the kernel uses to rapidly locate information about a page on the system. So I give you a virtual address and a process ID, and you are going to return me some information about that page, where it is, the permissions on it, you know, some information about the statistics, whatever. Right? Why is this done per process? Why couldn't I have a global one for the entire system? Every process is a separate page table. Why? What's that? Every process has the same view of memory, and the virtual addresses are specific to a process, right? So again, process and virtual address go together, right? They don't make any sense separate, right? All right. So, so okay. So let's start at one end. This is our usual. This is our usual technique in this class. We spend. We have some fun beating up a terrible idea, and then we move on to something that's a little bit better, right? So let's talk about flat page tables, right? So a flat page table is essentially what it sounds like. It's one array, 
And the array is indexed by the virtual page number. And the array can either store the page table entries directly, or maybe it has pointers to the page table entries, right? OK? And you know, here's how this would work, right? I have my, I have my process address space. I have this flat page table. I have page table entries, right, floating around in the kernel heap somewhere. And essentially, I just have a one-to-one -one mapping between virtual addresses and slots in this flat page table, right? I mean, it looks, the process translates to virtual address that's in its code segment. It translates right into the flat page table. I use it as an index, points to some page table entry, right? Same thing with the heap, right? So what about speed here? Well, what is, how fast can I do a translation here? It's a one. It's a single lookup. Yes, this is awesome, right? Great. It's used, all I do is I use the virtual page number directly as an index into my array. How large is this array? What's that? 2 ratio 20. 2 ratio 20 uh, I, I think you're saying it, but I think what, okay, can you convert it to bytes? Can anyone convert? 2 to the 20th. 4 megabytes. I, I actually think this is, I think, I think I lost a factor of 2 in there somewhere. But anyway, this is huge. This is more than I want, OK? And then most of this is unused, right? This has the same problem that I saw before, right? Where I have this address space that's mostly empty, right? And now I have a flat page table that's mostly empty, right? Most of these indexes are not used. Yeah, Isaac. No, 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 this is, a, this is a C array, right? I take the virtual page number, and that's just, so virtual page number zero is the zeroth index in my array, right? It's just a standard C array. I can, I can, I can allocate an array like this in C, and I can index it directly. So, right? uh, so, okay. so yeah. you have to allocate like in order. I have to allocate, right, one four megabyte piece of memory that's contiguous, or at least looks contiguous, right? So this is kind of terrible. Right? And again, this, this is like, we, we keep coming back to this. The sparsity of address spaces is always giving us problems, right? It gave us problems before. We talked about how to do translation with segments and pages, and now it's giving us problems. We're talking about how to do state, right? All right, so let's try a different, different approach, right? What about a linked list, OK? All I do is I keep a list of the, uh, all the PTEs. Maybe I sort them by virtual address, but I don't have to, right? And on every <clears throat> translation, I just search the list. Right? So here's how this would work. I have my page table entries. I put them into a list. Right? And now what happens? Right? The process tries to access a virtual address that's in its code segment. And I essentially just look through the linked list until I find the PTE that matches that. Right? So I'm looking for the page that matches that page. All right? So this is another approach. Speed. How many accesses on, in general will it take? O of n, where n is what? The number of virtual pages, right? Valid virtual pages in the process's address space. But what about compactness? How large is this data structure? You know, four bytes times n, potentially, right? And it's completely used, so that's great, right? It's, it's, it, this is, you know, this, so this is nice. And I just want to point out, this is a completely, especially when your processes have small numbers of pages, this is totally OK. Right? So for assignment three, we get people that decide that they need to do some sort of really complex uh, page table, like the one I'm about to describe. It's not super complex, but it's not necessarily the right thing. Whereas when you have processes that have small number of pages, this works completely fine. Right? This is a totally valid approach. Right? But let me talk about, about what a lot of modern systems actually do. Right? Because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to be a little bit more clever about how I use my data structures. All right? So Essentially, what I'm going to do is build something that looks like a tree, OK? And there's going to be one top-level node and then potentially a bunch of second-level nodes. And on some systems, they actually have a three-level page table, right? So there are actually three levels of this tree, right? And what I do is that I take my virtual page number, which is 20 bits, and I split it into multiple parts. And each piece is used as an index in, this, in a separate level of the tree, right? So with 4K pages, this works out kind of nicely, right? I split my 20-bit virtual page number into a 10-bit top and a 10-bit bottom. 
The 10 bit top is used as an index into the top level array. That's used to locate the second level array. And then the bottom 10 bits is used as an index into the second level array, and that's used to locate the page table entry. Right? One of the nice things about 4K pages is this. Right? Maybe this is why they're so popular. If I do this, every page table has 2 to the 10th entries. It's an array. And each entry is 4 bytes. So my page table, every, every node in my page table is 4K, or one page. Right? So that's kind of nice. Right? Now, again, so, so I, I've just walked through an example of how to do this, but let me walk through a, a visual example. Right? So, so what happens here? Okay? I'm given, I have a, every process has to have a first level page table. Right? This is 4K, if I have 4K pages. Right? So when I translate an address, I take the top 10 bits and I use those as an index into my first level page table. Okay? What happens next? What, is this, what, what do I do with these? What, what is this going to point to? It'll point to another page table, another 4K array, essentially. Right? And now what do I do? I take the bottom 10 bits, and I use those as an index into my second level page table. And that will either be or point to a page table entry. All right? So let me go through this again. All right? I use 10 bits as an index into the first level table to get to the second level table. Right? The first level table contains pointers to second level tables if they exist. Right? And the nice thing about this is I only have to allocate second level page tables for portions of the address space that need them. Right? Okay? So if my second level page table exists, the first level page table has a pointer to it. And then I use the bottom 10 bits of my address as an index into that second level page table. And that gets me my page table entry with information about this virtual address. Okay? Questions about this? So, so what does this mean, right? I, I, I think I should have had a slide for this, and I don't. Okay. So, so for this process, every process has, in order for this to work, every process has to have what? What, what part of this do I absolutely need? I need, I need the root, right? I need my first level table, right? So 4K per process regardless of how many virtual pages it has. And that's kind of tough, right? That's a little bit of a, a high constant factor, right? But OK, right? But then things get better. Because let's say, and I, I wish I could remember this, right? So, so it's 2 to the 10. Anyway, I won't, I won't think about it. But, but the idea is each second level table covers some fairly big piece of the process's address space. And any areas where the address space is empty, I don't need to allocate a second level table, right? If I had to get, if, if I had a process that was using its entire address space and I had, had to allocate every second level table, that would be terrible. But most address spaces are sparse, right? Most of the space is empty. And in that empty space, I don't need second level tables, right? So in the best case, let's say this is a process with one thread. It has a stack. It's got some heap allocated. And it's got a few code pages. At best, how many second level page tables will I need? Three, right? One second level page table will cover the entire code area. Another second level page table will cover the entire heap. And a third second level page table will cover the entire stack. Again, you know, ignore the other stacks now. Let's say this is a single threaded process, right? So that's great, right? And now I've got what? How much total memory devoted to, to translating addresses for this process? Anybody? Simple math? How many K? 16K, right? One first level page table. Three second level tables. Okay. So, what about the speed? How many entries does it take to translate to find a PTE on this on this approach? Oh, one essentially. It's two lookups, right? I look up first level page table, and then I do a lookup into the second level page. Table, right? It might be like three or four memory accesses, but it's just two 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 indices, right? It's a constant number of lookups. And that will actually depend on the tree depth. So if I was trying to be more clever and I had a three-level page table, which, which these do exist, right, then I might need a th to get a third index into a third-level table before I can, I can actually translate the address. What about compactness? I didn't really understand how to represent this, so I just said it depends on the sparsity of the address. Right? So, but there, there is a way you, know, you, you could calculate this, right? But it really depends on the sparsity address space. If, if the process, the, the worst case scenario is that the process has one page 
allocated that causes in every second level table, but it has all the second level tables allocated, right? That is really, really uncommon, right? Processes normally don't do that, right? When I get a heap, for example, my heap is, is contiguous and it grows contiguously, right? So I don't get like one heap page there and another heap page like, you know, 30 megabytes later in my virtual address space. I just, that is just not how process address spaces are laid out, right? They're sparse, but, but they're, you know, they're little bits of density here and there. All right. So let's talk, before we finish today, what time is it? Five minutes. All right. So let's talk about just in general, right? So we, we've been talking a lot, mainly what we've been focused on up till now is address translation, right? Address translation. How do we translate virtual addresses, right? How do we find out information about them? How do we store that information, et cetera, right? But remember, one of the things that we, we, we were thinking about doing with this whole virtual address abstraction is we, we had this grand plan that would actually allow us to provide the illusion that there was more memory on the system than there actually is, all right? And the way that we do this, I'm gonna describe right now. So what happens if we run out of memory? And this can happen, right? I mean, this happens all the time, right? On some level, as soon as the processes on your system allocate enough virtual address space to exhaust all of physical memory, you're, you're out of memory, right? And then you have to start playing games to get this to work well, right? And you want to use all the memory on your system. In general, memory is usually a lot faster than other, some of the other alternatives. So if you can, you'd like to allocate all the memory, right? But you know, let's say I have a process that you know, it's got three code pages, and then it starts running, and needs a stack page, and then it gets one page of heap, and maybe it gets two pages of heap right away, and now it needs to grow the heap, right? So I don't, I don't know why I made that animation. It's kind of stupid, right? I mean, you guys can imagine how this works. But anyway, that, that's the end, right? That's all that happens. Uh, this question mark. Okay, so, so what do I do now, right? What, what happens when we run out? So, so I've got two options, right? Someone, someone give me the, the, the easiest but potentially less desirable option. What's that? What's that? Well, okay, that's, that's even worse, right? Yeah, you could tell the programmer to, to do a better job of writing a program. That's probably not gonna work. What can I do in the moment? Right, I can just fail, you know? And essentially, when I run out of core, I can say, well, you know, if I'm trying to allocate memory in exec, then exec fails, and I go back to the original process that was trying to call exec and say, sorry, your process of transformation has failed, right? If I'm calling fork, I might fail fork and go back to the parent and say, sorry, you can't have any children right now. I don't have enough memory. Um, you know, if, if I'm trying to allocate more heap through S break, I might tell malloc, sorry about that. Like, I don't know what to tell you, but I don't, you know, I just can't help you out right now, right? Or if the process is trying to use more stack space, I don't, you know, there's not really a great thing to do there other than to just kill it, right? Because essentially it's, it's going to try to execute another instruction that's going to push and pop onto the stack. So if I fail at that point, you know, there's really, there's really no other way out, okay? What, but what else can I do, right? What else can I do? I can swap. What does that mean? What does is, what is, what is swapping fundamentally mean? Right, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating more space, right? And I'm creating more space by exploiting this property of the virtual address that I can move it around without telling the process about it, right? I can be sneaky, right? So because I have this level of indirection, right? Remember how Google Gaga I was about this level of indirection. I'm, I'm starting to feel that way again today, right? I have this great, great level of indirection that I can use and it essentially allows me to play these games behind a process's back, right? So without telling the process what's going on, I can, I can do things that, that it doesn't know about, and it doesn't have to know about, and maybe doesn't want to know about, you know? It's, it's like that guy in the Matrix, right? Ignorance is bliss, you know? Right? So, but what are the requirements for doing this? So the process was using some virtual addresses, remember? And those virtual addresses observed the memory interface. Loads and stores worked as the process expected, okay? What do I, you know, let's say I'm gonna play some games, right? The next time the process uses this virtual address, what has to happen? It has to work, it has to behave like memory, right? And in fact, it doesn't have to just behave like memory, it has to behave like the same memory that the process was using, right? So whatever games I play, when the process tries to access that address again, I better be able to put things back together, right? Now, in order to do this, while I'm playing my games, what do I have to do to the data that, that the process was using at that virtual address? I've got to preserve it, right? Because otherwise, if a process did a load 
and then a bunch of time went by and I played my magic tricks, and then it came back, sorry, if it did a store and a bunch of time went by and I played my games, and then it did a load, the load might return some different number, and the browser would be like, well, it's not behaving like memory, right? So you have to preserve the contents, okay? So let me just introduce you to swapping, and we'll come back to this on Friday, right? So we, we call this process swapping, and specifically we call it swapping when, when, as Isaac pointed out, we're using the disk, right? The disk is nice. Why is the disk nice? What is the disk, what is the disk usually compared to memory? It's huge, right? Potentially massive, even now, right? I mean, I don't know how much memory this thing has in it. I think it's like four gigs or something, right? But it's got 250 gigs of, of, of disk, right? So an order of magnitude or more and more disk than I have memory, right? So that's a good thing. What's the problem with the disk? It's slow, it's slow, it's really slow. Potentially really slow, okay? So here, here's another case where we're trying to present this illusion, right? And the goal of the illusion that we're gonna try to create through swapping is your system has memory that is as large as the size of your disk, but as fast as RAM, as fast as memory, right? If we can play our game well, we can present that illusion. If we don't play our game well, then your system feels like it has as much memory as RAM, but that memory is as slow as disk, right? So this is terrible, right? This, this, this system would, would feel really, really unusable, okay? All right, so let's, uh, we'll go through this next time. I think there's one more slide I wanna do, right? So the other thing that, so what determines this, how well this works, right? How well we do between the two extremes, right? Is how we choose pages to move back and forth from swap to memory, and in particular, how we choose pages to remove from memory, because as we'll see on Friday, when we bring pages in, it's usually because we have to, all right? When we, when we kick pages out, it's usually because we choose to. So on Friday, we'll go through swapping, and we'll talk about how we select pages to move back and forth to swap.